Buenos dias con todos y todas. Good morning to all. Just giving a few moments so people can join. And see Argentina, Canada, Chile, Cuba, Antiguan Barbuda. Very nice. Lima, Peru. Bogota, Colombia, Paraguay. Very nice. Mexico, Philippines. Welcome. South Africa, Colombia, Ethiopia, Venezuela, Haiti, Morocco, Uruguay, Germany, Brilliant. Trinidad and Tobago, Dominica, Belize. Amazing. This is way over a uh, Pan American <laughs> climate and health course. St. Vincent de the Grenadines, Nigeria, Trinidad and Tobago. Bonjour, IT. Canada, Peru, Brazil, Grenada. Yeah, good morning to all. Bahamas, Scotland, amazing. Colombia, Peru. Buenos dias con todos. Solo damos. Good morning, everyone. So 30 more seconds so that everyone can join the meeting. Cuba. United States. Very nice. Turks and Caicos. Um, United Arab States. Excellent. Okay, I think I think we're gonna start and we can um, we can start slowly with the housekeeping and then we can move uh, to to the presentations. Um, but thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure to uh, and, a, and an honor to be hosting and moderating this session. Uh, my name is Daniel Booth. I'm the Uni Chief on Climate Change and Health for the Pan American Health Organization. PAHO, I'm based in Washington, D.C., and we manage uh, from there the agenda for the Americas on climate change, water sanitation, hygiene, waste management, chemical safety, um, air quality, and environmental health surveillance. So it's a pleasure to be here with you today. So I'll, I'll be, I think that we do have, I don't see, although I don't see the button of interpretation on my own screen, I guess we do have it. Uh, you can find interpretation um, in, in your, you should find it in your um, Zoom session. So live interpretation is available in English, Spanish, and French. So please go ahead and, and use this button. We'll be switching in this session from English to Spanish. So please find the time to uh, find this button if you need interpretation to navigate through the languages. Hay una interpretación en vivo. Eh, ustedes tienen este botón que there is a live interpretation. There is this button where you can choose your language and you can uh, choose English, French, or Spanish as um, languages you can listen to. So this course is a, uh, as you know, an online session course every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, we do have um, this specific session today, Thursday, April 13, on health adaptation process, key actors, activities, and partnerships. Uh, I hope you enjoy it as part of the this online training course. And please use the chat and the Q&A to uh, ask questions as we move. Um, so these are some housekeeping for the ones uh, taking the whole course. The general considerations, uh, attendance will be verified when you are connected. So uh, please, may uh, you don't have to do anything else apart from, from, from joining the session and hopefully staying the whole 90 minutes. The session, uh, the, the, 
run of show these uh, of, to, of today is that uh, I'll be doing a, a, a presentation in the beginning, and then I'm going to have a panel. We have three excellent panelists to discuss uh, with you today. Um, and at the end, if we still have time at the end of the session, we, we want to have, or we're trying to, to keep a moment to have uh, some interaction with participants. So uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A and we can uh, ask panelists uh, to discuss the questions. These sessions will be recorded and posted on the website within 24 hours. I think you know that already. And slide decks for the main presentations are available for download on the course website. So today, like I said, we have the pleasure to uh, have this session with uh, Dr. Carmen Siganda, Dr. Carmen Siganda from the Ministry of Public Health of Uruguay. I, I will introduce their bios when we are done with the uh, uh, initial presentation and we are about to start the panel. But we also have the pleasure to have uh, to having Craig Brown, uh, Dr. Craig Brown from uh, Vancouver Coastal Health and Anivar Peralta from uh, the Five Cs. He's a project development specialist. Um, so with no further ado, I'll switch to my presentations and to my presentation and then we can move ahead with our session today. So thank you so much. We have at this point over 400 participants. So I'll switch now to Spanish. So please find the translation button if you need it. Uh, this uh, and the panel will will host it both in uh, we'll have it in Spanish and English. So please find the time to find the translation button and we'll switch to Spanish now. Thank you. Bueno, hoy la idea es hablar un poco del proceso de adaptación. Today I'll be talking about the adaptation process regarding health systems. We have key actors, activities, and partnerships. Um, we need to think about how we can build an agenda to strengthen health and climate activities. At PAHO, and in agreement with 35 countries in the Americas and 18 territories in the Americas, we developed an agenda to strengthen these climate and health actions. The agenda includes main, uh, seven main working pillars. The main aim is to create uh, climate resilient health systems and to reduce mortality and morbidity related to climate events. I'm sorry, Daniel's audio is quite poor, so we'll do our best to summarize what he's saying. This is a main aim of um, the uh, of PAHO's agenda. Regarding institutional structure and governance, I would like to um, address these pillars and then I will provide some examples and say which are the necessary structures and partnerships in our experience um, after working with the countries I've mentioned. Regarding governance and institutional structures, um, they are the, the main driver of um, working with, with health in the systems that coordinate climate change related actions. And this is the case nationally and regionally and globally. Um, health, the health system should include uh, communication um, networks with other sectors. And this should be the case within the Ministry of Health. So we need to um, be able to agree among the different stakeholders so that we can have a common health position in order to um, participate 
in interministerial uh, meeting uh, committees on climate change. Health should create knowledge and also um, take this position to other strategic stakeholders and other sectors, the private sector as well. And we should, uh, they should talk about the strategies and, and, and tools to strengthen health systems and to make health systems health, uh, health climate resilient and to reduce uh, mortality and mobility related to climate events. The second step in this structure has to do with uh, health and education planning. Once health is strong and participates in institutional structures, then it is time for planning. Uh, there are several documents that countries, provinces uh, can develop. And also several countries can create these documents to create work plans, specific health and climate change action plans. Therefore, the NDCs for the UNF triple C vulnerability studies on health, planning, national adaptation plans that include health issues. All, all of them are essential documents to be able to understand the impact of climate change on health and also which challenges the health sector and other sectors have. When it comes to turning uh, health systems into climate resilient systems and to reduce mobility and mortality in, in this regard. The second pillar is to uh, uh, get the necessary funding for um, climate and health projects. When we have the planning and the funds, what can we do? What can we suggest? There are four main pillars in this regard. And the countries have recognized this, but not just countries, also uh, mayors, for instance, in some countries who are working, working at province levels. Uh, in Argentina, in Neuquén, Patagonia, they are working in this regard. And I will share some specific examples. The idea is to strengthen health infrastructure and to build climate resilient systems. Therefore, infrastructure needs to be safe so that uh, different types of hurricanes or droughts can be faced. Also, heat waves. Because all these events might um, increase the number of patients the health system needs to care for. Um, therefore, we need to build um, integrated systems for health and climate surveillance so that we can, first of all, prevent diseases so that we can understand the impact of climate change on health, also prevent um, conditions related to climate change through uh, integrated surveillance systems that um, are integrated with other meteorological services. Um, they should be able to develop response plans and to prepare systems to face uh, these problems and to reduce uh, uh, the impact and to recover more efficiently from them. And I think that free health uh, research and education includes health practitioners, but also the, the general population. These actions focus on the health sector and on what the health sector does. There is also a fourth pillar that has to do with um, health co-benefits outside 
the health system, uh, for instance, uh, food systems, green areas, etc. They have a direct impact on health, and this is why health also needs to uh, develop plans and policies with other sectors. Um, I would like to tell you about uh, some strategic stakeholders when it came to implementing this strategic and ambitious plan. Uh, before that, I would like to call your attention to the following. Climate change is here. We can see it, we can feel it every day. There are heat waves. Today, I'm in New York, for instance, and, stu and today we have a, a record uh, uh, high temperature uh, in the city of New York. Therefore, the impact can be of uh, climate change can be felt. However, climate change is uh, affects vulnerable populations the most, and and that, that that we know, of course. But we need to remember that we have an incomplete basic infrastructure agenda. For instance, the people that are most affected by climate change are the ones that um, create less climate change. In fact, also the ones that emit fewer uh, greenhouse gases but they're the most affected ones. In the Americas, we have, we still have uh, people uh, with open air uh, defecation. We have 160 million people who have no access to safe water sources. Regarding air pollution, over 300, 320,000 People die every year in Latin America and the Caribbean because of cardiac and respiratory diseases and cancer that have to do with air pollution. Over 74 million people depend on polluting fuels, wood, coal, and kerosene for cooking and heating. Therefore, you know, remember the millennium goals. We haven't quite achieved them. Therefore, we now have problems that are worsened by climate change. And the people affected have uh, less access to health services, and they're more vulnerable to air, air pollution, um, chemicals, etc. And, and they are the most affected ones. Uh, there's over 1,000 premature deaths a year. Uh, they could be avoided. They have to do with the environmental risks. And we already have the necessary knowledge to be able to close that gap, but we are not succeeding. And this has to do with equity. The percentage of deaths related to environmental risks in high income countries is 13%, while in low and middle income countries, this number is almost 19%. So there's an obvious difference in access and also in, in the contamination, the pollution in low income and high income countries, and also the low income population within uh, high income countries. So we have differences within a city, within a country and within a region in the Americas. So it's really important to, to work on this um, inequ inequities in impacts if we want to provide the best health possible for the entire population of the Americas. So for this, in PAHO, we have an agenda that is the agenda for the Americas on health and climate change. You have it, you have the cover there, and it's related to the sustainable development goals and the strategic plan of PAHO. And these are things that are uh, at the core of what I'm going to discuss now 
And also the WHO, um, I suggest you, you learn about this manifesto for a healthy recovery from COVID-19 that has to do with protecting and preserving the source of human nature, the, of human health, that is nature. So green areas, and we're working with within the WHO, uh, working on the link between health and environment to invest in essential services, uh, water and sanitation, to ensure a quick and healthy energy transition to promote healthy, sustainable food systems, build healthy, livable cities, and also to stop using taxpayers' money to fund pollution. As a health sector, we have a regulatory responsibility as well. So we need to ensure that countries have very clear guidelines and criteria to stop subsidizing the use of polluting fuels at home, in transportation, and to generate electrical power in general. This is really important and, and key to have a healthy, sustainable world. At the COP26, so two years ago, we worked on a healthy climate prescription letter. I, I always like to go back to this story because organizations representing over 46 million health professionals from 100 countries started working on a special health prescription, we, we call it, and that is very representative, but it has an impact on policy and on the progress of a uh, global health and climate agenda for all countries. Today, we have 69 countries that have entered into this initiative. The, the acronym is ATTACH. It's an Alliance for Transformative Action on Climate and Health. And uh, it, it includes already countries from different regions and the countries have made commitments on adaptation and also mitigation actions um, to mitigate the effects of, of greenhouse gases in the health sector. And now going into those pillars that I mentioned at first, we have within the governance strategy, we already mentioned some key partners and those regional alliances also include multi-country agreements. Perhaps Dr. Siganda will discuss um, the Mercosur and Associated Countries Ministries of Health Declaration on Health and Climate Change. Um, Dr. Siganda, I'm sure, will go into depth on this. And now we are in the process of having a new agreement for South American countries and ministries. We also have one for the Caribbean, the Caribbean Action Plan on Health and Climate Change. This was signed not only by, by health ministries, but also by environment ministries. So these are strategic partners at all levels. Um, at all levels of, of government. It can also not just be multi-country agreements, but also within a country agreements with, b between provinces like in Argentina that have those shared plans and also locally, not just municipally, but, but also locally. So we can have these plans that clearly link health and the environment and have measurable, clear uh, plans. And that is what those plans have. We have the Caribbean Action Plan, the Climate Change Plan uh, of the Andes, and we're now working on one for the Central American Climate Change Action Plan Health Agenda. So this multi-country at the national level agreements 
of course, we can also use those tools within uh, countries as well, as I was mentioned. And with Health Canada, we developed uh, this guide for implementing uh, vulnerability and assessments and national adaptation plans. We have a guide for that, for health national adaptation plans, and also how to prepare NDCs that are the nationally determined contributions under the, the agreement, the UN agreement. So these are all tools that are available for you, and I suggest you, you get to know them. We are also work on uh, surveys and country profiles in which we look at the projections, the climate projections for each of those countries and how that reflects on potential and estimated health indicators and what actions should country take. That is the, the first step for a national action or adaptation plan at the national or subnational level. And now and um, I'm going to show an example of how to do that on a provincial level or, or a state level within a country. I borrowed these from our colleagues into how they created a committee a sort of task force because we discussed governance and the preparation of an action plan at the province level. So this is the planning part where we I, they identified the gaps and they developed um, the guidelines for what do we want to do so to make the Neuquen's health system more climate resistant more climate resilient and reduce the impacts caused by climate change. They mapped the strategic partners to work on environmental health and climate change within the province of Neuquén, also connecting and including the, the national level institutions. But the province takes the, the leadership role within the, the provincial action. And they generated a health and climate change province plan for Neuquén. I'm, I can't go into detail, but hopefully we have some of the colleagues from Neuquén um, here online. E, and so that we can connect participants to them so that they can share this very uh, fruitful work that they have done. They worked so hard on this and they also use funds from the Green Climate Fund for this. So I unfortunately can't go into detail, but perhaps you can connect with them if you want to learn more. So we need a strategy to generate risk maps. Uh, I'm, they're letting me know I only have five minutes. So to, we need to combine information from the surveillance system connected within a single platform with climate and meteorological information, environmental and demographic information to generate risk maps to identify the population that is potentially being more affected according to, to the different possible climate uh, scenarios to generate early alert systems. And we can have um, those for 10 years, perhaps for some illnesses and diseases such as dengue that is not right now in some countries, but because of the distribution of the Aedes aegypti mosquito is growing, then, for example, now in the US, uh, the Lyme disease that is transmitted by um, ticks 
is now spreading to Canada because the tech is spreading. So we can project the change in behavior and ecological behavior of those species and also foresee the, the change in the prevalence of those illnesses. I had a very specific example about dengue. I'm not going to go into detail, but for example, in Argentina, they have these early systems for heat. Colombia has these new newsletters on climate and health that are go issued monthly and they tell you what you can expect on your specific region of the country for the future according to the projections made. Cuba also does this. Some other countries have also made progress on this. And now going to the final part that is policies and intersectoral actions. We have actions that look to, to prevent diseases and to promote health. We worked on a study in Colombia that if they implement their NDC, this can bring financial benefits of up to almost $13 billion for 2030. And they can save oh, more than 1.8 billion US dollars a year. So using perhaps this lens of, of the avoided costs for the cost uh, of inaction, because if we do nothing and we keep this trend using fossil fuels, what are the impacts that we can expect so we need to use the argument of health to protect the lives of people and do this transformation or overhaul of, of the social systems to reduce the emissions from fossil fuels. We have uh, resilient healthcare facilities. On Tuesday, you had the session that, that was for that, but it's one of the very key pillars of our agenda. And in terms of education and training, we have this book. And I would really like it if you could take a look at it because it's made especially for healthcare professionals in general, but also for anyone who has an interest in learning about the illnesses that are an extreme climate or, or weather event can bring, such as a heat wave or a hurricane for health in particular, and especially for medical professionals, what drugs you should not prescribe, for example, during a heat wave, because they can exacerbate the effects of a heat wave. So these are materials that are very important that are available from us. Uh, aside from the courses, of course, this is one of the courses that PAHO is working with, with the IAI and Columbia University, you of course know about that. We also have a course on water security, water safety, and we're working on preparing portfolios and local capacities for the Green Climate Fund, for the Belmont Forum and other cooperation agencies. It's key to train the, the healthcare sector to be able so that they can prepare investment proposals to transform the healthcare system. Our colleague uh, Anivar is going to talk about this uh, climate change center and the work they're doing in the Caribbean in cooperation with PAHO and other partners. So thank you so much for your attention. I don't wanna take up more time. So now I'm going to introduce the other colleagues in the panel. Uh, perhaps you can turn your cameras on, Craig and Anivar. Anivar, I can see you, Anivar. Oh, there you go. Great. 
to English, back to English. Um, and, and then we can have a balance uh, because Carmen is going to speak in Spanish. Uh, Craig and Anivar are going to speak in English. So please um, choose your language of preference in, in the translations button. Um, I'll present first Carmen Siganda, who is the director of the Environmental and Occupational Health Division of the Ministry of Public Health of Uruguay. Uh, she's a medical toxicologist uh, with public uh, diploma in public health. She's a professor at School of Medicine and the focal point of the National System of Response to Climate Change of Uruguay and of the Intergovernmental Commission of, uh, on Environmental and Occupational Health of Mercosur. We're gonna have soon after uh, uh, her initial words, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Craig Brown, uh, who is the Senior Scientist, Climate Change and Health at Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, where he supports climate change adaptation projects in the health sector with a strong emphasis on community collaboration. Craig is also an associate faculty member at Royal Rhodes University in the School of Environmental Sustainability and has served as an author on national and international climate change knowledge assessments, including the IPCC, IPCC 6 assessment report. And we have the pleasure of having Mr. Anivar Peralta, who is the Project Development Specialist for the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, which is based in uh, Belmopan, City, Belize. He holds a master's degree in climate change from the University of South Pacific, Fiji. So a lot of experience in um, small island developing states. With over, I see that someone is saying that they can hear that, that they lost the audio. I don't know if um, everyone can do the same. Um, with over 12 years of working in the climate change field, he utilizes uh, his vast experience, knowledge, and resources to contribute to the 5C's mission. And as a project development specialist, he's currently providing the technical expertise to mobilize sustainable and impactful climate change financing to build uh, climate resilience and low emission development to Caribbean countries. In, in, in partnership with PAHO, uh, European Union, and other partners. So I'll, I'll pass the mic to Carmen Siganda. Paso el micrófono a Carmen para que pueda hacer. La idea es hacer intervenciones de cinco minutos cada, donde puedan comentar un poco de su experiencia. Y luego tenemos dos rondas de preguntas. And the idea is uh, Carmen to uh, have a five minute explanation of your experience and then I give the floor to. And then we're gonna have two rounds of questions and maybe a final round of questions at the end with questions coming from the audience. So thank you, Carmen. Gracias, Carmen. Y tienes el micrófono. Thank you, Carmen, you have the floor. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for um, this invitation to participate and to share with you the experience in this uh, southern cone market Mercosur region. Here I have a brief uh, presentation to show you how we've been working. The full states that now address climate change and health issues in the intergovernmental uh, Commission of the Environmental Health and Workers in Mercosur, uh, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. This commission has six strategic uh, pillars. So um, these are usually people that work at the Ministry of Health. And we actually coordinate these aspects. Our mandate uh, is implemented through meetings of the ministries of health, also intergovernmental advisory committees. Our mandate includes six pillars, workers' health, waste, water and sanitation, chemicals, environmental health in children and climate change and health, which was included in 2009. 
We work with ministeri ministerial resolutions, we, and we've been doing so since 2005. As you can see, these topics are interrelated because there is this uh, uh, transverse sanity. Uh, climate change is caused by GHG gases. Therefore, chemicals uh, are uh, included in this process uh, from the beginning. These climate change affects the health of children and workers. It has to do with uh, the necessary management of water and sanitation and waste management as well. We've been working on several documents since 2009. We started working um, in, uh, with Paraguay while they were presiding over the committee. We started working on a first uh, action strategy to protect human health. And this was uh, the, our work found its inspiration on Pajo's work. This strategy was signed at the end of the year in Montevideo. In 2011, we organized a climate and health training institute. It was the first intersectoral work we did with the IAI, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. Uh, the IAI uh, is now based in Uruguay. Of course, we also worked with PAHO, with EDI, with um, which is the Columbia University Global Change Institute, which later became a consortium uh, at the University of Columbia. And also, and, and all of this allowed us to train uh, employees from ministries of health and all, also health practitioners and people from the health, from the climate area, not just from the medical sur, but also other Spanish-speaking countries from Latin America. In 2015, we confirmed the declaration of Mercosur health ministers while Brazil was presiding over the, the community. Uh, countries preside over the Mercosur for six months, and have, uh, we have Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, and provisional uh, presidents complete their mandate every six months. In 2018, Bajo organized a workshop in Argentina. We shared how we were working regarding NAPS. Uh, uh, there, there was uh, not just climate change plans that every country has and that are part of the framework convention. We also aim to have a specific health and climate change plan. Uh, towards the end of 2018, we issued a, a new declaration of Mercosur health ministers in Montevideo. So we needed to reinforce the importance of working on climate change and health. We this time we worked on we worked on adaptation but also mitigation. 2023, we have a new challenge. We have the provisional uh, Argentina is a provisional uh, president of the Mercosur, and our challenge is to update the Mercosur action strategy. These are the topics of the 2009 strategy: creating scientific producing scientific evidence about climate change and its impact and its impact on health, raising people's awareness, not just the population, but also students, health workers. Number three, to forge partnerships um, among the different countries. We need to work jointly with ministries of health, transport, industry, foreign affairs. These are the ones that have participated in climate change framework conventions. It's very important for the health sector to 
participate with its uh, delegates in the work commissions. Number four is developing both human and, finan and, and financial resources. As Daniel has said, to, to do things, we need a plan and we need a source of funding. In our first 2009 strategy, we focused on the adapting the, the health sector. And we've always been told, well, the health sector needs to adapt. If there's, if there's a cold wave, how, how does this affect the population? How does a heat wave affect the population? How can we prepare health services to adapt to these extreme climate events, uh, hurricanes, floodings, etc.? cetera? Um, but then we, as Daniel has just said, we noticed that if the health system were a country, it would be the fifth uh, country regarding CO2 emissions. There are huge hospitals, so we, we do emit these gases, but also the pharmaceutical industry that works for the health sector are, are large contaminators as well. And when users go to the health centers, also use transport, energy, etc. Therefore, we need to also focus, we need to focus on adapting, but also on mitigation. De la comisión a que trabaja a nivel Finally, de... these are the challenges of the Mercosur Committee. We need to strengthen the health, environment, climate nexus. We, should, we must keep participating in every regional, local, national event. We need to submit our NDCs in the area of health. These are the commitment, commitments that every country should submit. We need health commitments. It's not just about mitigating GAG um, gases and improving green areas. These are health co-benefits, yes, of course. But also, we need to have specific uh, health, uh, public health NDCs. Desafíos y retos es contar. A further challenge is having national health plans, not just regarding adaptation and mitigation aspects. And finally, and something that is very important, you know, this health, um, uh, this health system course we are conducting now is being a we need to work with uh, these uh, stakeholders to have greener hospitals. Uh, we have been able to see what this whole climate change and health thing is about, because health providers will be interested in being more efficient, in saving energy, in managing hospital waste effectively as well. In, they will focus on managing water efficiently. They will want to have also green procurement. Who are we buying from? What are we buying? Also health-related inputs. And this was clear during the COVID pandemic. We need to make the most of this experience. How do we organize our work? Which vulnerabilities did we notice? How can we improve on them and how can we have a climate um, perspective let's say this is what health environment and climate change is about how we can work with a from a one health perspective it's human environmental and global health and we should take this as a, an opportunity to change so these, here you can find uh, the information regarding the resources used by our health ministers. Thank you so much. Uh, very important point that you raised. So I'll pass straight to, to Craig so he can, um, he can make his uh, open statements, tell us a little bit about his experience and how he sees that the community engagement at the more local level can support 
uh, these plans that we are talking here. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Daniel, and thanks uh, formally for the opportunity to speak, and to my wonderful colleague, Dr. Peter Berry, for forwarding the invitation to me from Health Canada. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm I'm speaking to you from Vancouver, uh, Canada, which is on the west coast of Canada, a very large country. I'm in a province called British Columbia, uh, and I'm one of uh, I work for one of five uh, regional health authorities. So we provide health services for over a million people. Uh, we operate 13 hospitals and hundreds of other uh, care sites. I'm speaking today from uh, public health. That's the that's the job I do. Uh, but I did want to say um, that although I'm focusing on adaptation and resilience activities, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health also does much of the work that uh, Carmen just mentioned around uh, waste reduction and greenhouse gas reductions in our facilities and and all of that. So. There's more information that I could share about those activities for those that are interested. I'm part of a fairly small but growing team of public health staff that works, uh, as Daniel mentioned, to uh, support and protect health in our communities as the climate changes. That means contributing to, you know, healthy, livable cities, strong ecosystems, and and and. A big part of what we do is contributing to communities, local governments, uh, their readiness or their preparedness for extreme weather events. And if I was to categorize our activities in the last few years, let's say the last five years, there's kind of uh, three phases, really. Uh, and I liked Carmen's slide that showed the the timeline. So this is my attempt at a timeline. And, and they're really important kind of windows of opportunity. So basically, before 2019, our activities related to climate change and health adaptation in public health were largely uh, driven by internal champions, we call them, or people who took it upon themselves to lead in this area. We didn't have a very formal approach or a strategic approach to our activities. Um, we, in British Columbia, we have the, the British Columbia Centers for Disease Control, and they really were an anchor institution for us in the early days in British Columbia for climate change and health adaptation. That changed when Health Canada funded 10 organizations across Canada to undertake uh, climate change and health adaptation projects. And Vancouver Coastal Health and our colleagues at Fraser Health, one of the other five regional health authorities in British Columbia, we were awarded three years of funding from Health Canada. And that represented a big change. Uh, it meant that we were able to work together with our colleagues in health emergency management and in facilities and in public health. And this is when I think things really started to uh, gain a lot of momentum. So now instead of it really just being the BC Center for Disease Control and some a few uh, really engaged staff members, we now had the opportunity to build a bit of a team. Uh, and then the next major thing that happened that allowed us to continue to grow in this space uh, was in 2021, we experienced an unprecedented heat event here in in. British Columbia and in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, we're typically a, a temperate uh, climate. We're a coastal community. We don't uh, get really winter. We don't get hot summers. Uh, and we experienced extremely high temperatures during the day and overnight. Many of you know that, that hundreds of people died. Uh, and that has spurred a tremendous amount of action here. So it's a very sad event and tragic event. But it represented a, an, a, a very important uh, turning point for our field in British Columbia. And luckily, uh, the province of British Columbia also uh, rose to this challenge and through a, a provincial climate change adaptation strategy, alongside with our Ministry of Health, all a whole other a group of, of really amazing people have come online to contribute to this space. So I'll, I'll just end my short section here by saying that's that's a bit of a brief history, and it shows that this field 
just grows over time. And we're now in a place where we're really, we've got a lot of great people working on, on this issue. And now, of course, the challenge, which I'll probably speak to later, is how do we stay coordinated and make sure that we're uh, all heading in the right direction and, and doing great work. So that's that's my introductory remarks for now. And back to you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Very, uh, very interesting story. And it shows that uh, although things go slowly sometimes, <laughs> but steadily, they, they are advancing. And uh, it's great to see that although we sometimes have some up and downs and bumps on the road, you know, we can have this core team continuing to think of and, and pushing uh, the, the way forward. So I also would like to recognize Peter Berry's role in that as Health Canada, since he's connected with us today. Um, and I'll, I would like to pass, and we're gonna have uh, follow-up questions for, for you, as you know, but uh, Anivar, um, uh, Peralta, you can tell us a little bit about the, the, the the history, like since you're doing these historical recordings of what's going on, uh, you can tell us a little bit about uh, the five C's and uh, and and your experience in in, the, in that role with the project that uh, PAHO, uh, EU Forum, and many other partners like the five C are implementing in the region of the Caribbean with regards to uh, strengthening um, uh, climate resilient health systems. In, in the Caribbean. So please go ahead, uh, Anivar, and share with us some of your insights about the partnerships that are needed to foster uh, more projects and funding for implementation. Thank you. Uh, definitely. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, thank you for all your presentation and the introduction. Excellent work. Um, uh, my colleague, Karen, Carmen, Sorry, apologies, Carmen. Thank you very much for excellent uh, presentation as well. And um, Craig as well, excellent uh, synopsis of the current situation and the um, trajectory of uh, evolution of how things have uh, progressed um, there in Canada. So um, I must commend all of you guys. So um, I'll be speaking from um, at a project development specialist angle um, based at the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center where where we focus towards building climate resilience within the Caribbean region. Um, this in, in also captures the CARIFORUM Cari member states, which includes um, Haiti. And, um, and, and, and with our main mission to initiate and coordinate the, the delivery of innovative, transformative, and evidence-based climate change solutions to improve uh, the resilience of uh, the people within the region. So therefore, that's our response, that's our mandate. Um, while our institutions is very uh, small and it's growing, it's just over, over 10 years old. Um, we are managing and coping with the, with the health, with the impacts of climate change, because of course, climate change is um, very, um, the impacts are very wide within the Caribbean. It affects um, the various sectors um not only health but water agriculture food um the environment um infrastructure uh, different um angles where climate change affects uh, the, the the different countries within uh, the caribbean region and therefore the need and the urgency to respond is very very high and therefore you know it's a lot of demand that comes uh, to us to try to respond to them in a very timely manner manner as you know um, small island development states within the caribbean region um they are low low income countries you know with very limited financial resources uh, including um local capacities so therefore uh there's a strong urgent uh, need uh, to to uh, provide support and that is what the sent the five c's you know, um where where i work uh, tries to do. You know, we mobilize our human capacity and technical expertise to try to best uh, respond to those uh, impacts of the of the Caribbean um, um, nations. Uh, one of the ways that we do it is to try to see how best we can mobilize climate financing, given that the economies are very small and very um, very constricted towards the tourism uh, industry, and therefore. Um, uh, a lot of financial support is required by the uh, governments of the various countries. So therefore, we uh, see how best we can partner with um, uh, different institutions, uh, different um, 
multilateral agencies uh, such as the Green Climate Fund, uh, the Adaptation Fund, the United Nations, uh, World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization as well, to see how best we can uh, coordinate and mobilize climate financing to respond and address those climate change impacts. And now moving on towards uh, this uh, particular um, uh, webinar, um, the five C's is very instrumental towards responding to climate change. Uh, and in this case, uh, towards uh, the health, uh, we're making a focus towards health. And uh, we have uh, partnered with um, the European Union and the Pan American Health Organization uh, with a project uh, titled Strengthening Climate Resilient Health Systems in the Caribbean, whereby we have taken the role towards uh, two, two items. One is the communication aspects, uh, which we try to uh, bring about visibility and highlight the impacts of climate change and how is it that uh, the general population within the Caribbean countries uh, can uh, be aware of the health impacts uh, uh, brought about by climate change, as well as how is it that they can respond towards uh, these impacts. Uh, this, of course, is trying to, um, uh, to, to create a, a change in the mindset, a change in practices, change in livelihoods to to build their resilience within uh, uh, their countries, especially at the community level. Another aspect which I'm very involved in and uh, taking a leading role on is the development of uh, high quality uh, concept notes, uh, which will be uh, uh, developed and submitted to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, Green, Green Climate Fund, sorry. Um, uh, you have known um, this is one of the largest um, uh, funding institutions um, uh, that basically uh, provides uh, financing at uh, different uh, modalities uh, in grants and concessional loans, uh, leverages financing with private sectors as well to best respond to the impacts of climate change, both in the mitigation side towards uh, building low emission development uh, pathways and both uh, in the adaptation aspect, you know, towards uh, building climate resilience. Uh, of course, uh, it, within the health sector and within this uh, project that we are partnering with EU and uh, PAHO, we are uh, exploring both uh, modalities, ensuring that we have um, the mitigation aspect and the adaptation aspect in those uh, towards uh, mobilizing financing for uh, these countries. Uh, and of course, the whole idea is to strengthen and build their climate uh, uh, resilience within the health sectors to ensure that uh, the impacts of climate change are, are not um, uh, passed on towards uh, these uh, the, the larger population. And of course, there's various ways of how to go about providing uh, support in terms of developing these projects. I can um, talk slightly about uh, uh, some aspects of it, and I believe, you know, in the discussion, uh, we can more elaborate on these things, but um, one of the things that we have to ensure is that to, to put all the, all the necessary uh, elements in place, and Daniel spoke about it, different, uh, uh, you need to ensure that there's uh, proper institutional and legislative and, and policy um, uh, frameworks in place to ensure that uh, whatever actions are done within the health, those things are, um, are in place as a solid foundation. This includes also the um, health national adaptation plans, of course, this provides uh, the sustainability uh, for the long term because, of course, planning is uh, done uh, to ensure maximum impact in the long term. So this is something also that needs to be covered. And one critical aspect as well that needs to be uh, covered is the, the country needs. Uh, and by that, I mean going down at the ground level with the stakeholders, with those that are being affected. Uh, what is it that uh, uh, they need to be responsive to climate change? Um, what vulnerabilities do they have? Uh, what climate change risk are they facing? You know, how is it that we can go about uh, addressing those impacts to support uh, those communities and so forth? So those are very uh, important aspects. Um, and of course, this uh, uh, takes time. And of course, um, the engagement process uh, uh, is iterative. Uh, it's ongoing, and we have to ensure that uh, during this process, all the necessary information is captured. Um, so uh, as part of uh, this process with the project with EU uh, uh, um, and PAHO, we're providing support to, to five member countries. Uh, this is St. Lucia, the Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, Grenada, and Belize. 
So these countries are, are, have been selected towards providing, um, towards um, receiving the, the support needed to mobilize financing towards uh, the, uh, building their climate resilience. Of course, one of the critical uh, components of this uh, process is to ensure that uh, health national adaptation uh, outcomes um, and objectives and priorities are considered to ensure a maximum impact to these countries. And of course, when designing these projects, all the elements are mentioned by uh, Carmen as well as Craig needs to be a uh, focus because now um, by ensuring that you have country needs, you, you design projects in a way that it cover, covers uh, uh, retrofitting, enhancing uh, uh, um, healthcare facilities, allowing them to become smart and, and green. Uh, the integration of um, also is considered integration of uh, renewable energy, also different aspects such as um, water systems, uh, proper and um, waste at disposal uh, systems also need to be enhanced, including also surveillance systems. All of those aspects are, are considered uh, within the design to ensure um, that uh, the, the projects are designed to meet the needs of, of those um, uh, um, countries. So, um, and of course, it's iterative. Uh, we have to dialogue continuously with the governments to ensure that uh, what uh, they really need is in there. And of course, uh, the sustainable financing, ensure that also um, uh, once the project is designed um, and it's completed, uh, the sustainability. And one of the areas is to build the capacity of uh, practitioners and technical officers, you know, in the health um, uh, facilities to ensure that um, uh, the continuous uh, monitoring, evaluation, and, and also the, uh, the improvement of the current designs are maintained for, for longevity and to ensure that these services, health services are available uh, to the general public, especially in times of disaster, especially in times of need. It's not only when uh, we, we, um, uh, it's uh, business as usual, um, where there's no disasters and so forth, especially. So that's why these are, uh, our facilities are very critical. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there um, for further discussion and um, looking forward to, to hearing um, comments and questions um, from sure. the. We, we already have, thank you, one of our very important points. Um, we have already a lot of questions on the chat, some of them addressing uh, some questions and comments about the Apache. Uh, uh, which is one of the possibilities that countries have to seek for a support at the global level and uh, financing, also access to financing. You were mentioning many of them that your uh, 5Cs are working with many other partners on developing project, project proposals for the Caribbean countries, uh, for the Green Climate Fund and potentially other donors. There are some comments. Uh, I see Marcelo Vega asking, um, uh, about other opportunities for financing. So tomorrow we're gonna to have a session with the Belmont Forum, which is uh, uh, another potential funder for climate and health. Uh, we are part of this uh, steering committee of climate, environment and health. There's a specific call that is going to be open, I think tomorrow, by in fact, or, or next week, uh, there will be open. Uh, Anwar is adding to the chat information about this session, this informative session tomorrow. Uh, we'll be there, uh, WMO will be there, uh, IAI and many other partners. Uh, it's to uh, fund um, research for climate change, environment and health. So I hope that that uh, can also support uh, um, some actions that you want to take in your countries, but not only at the country level, but also as many of you mentioned at subnational levels, uh, provinces and, and even community levels, which are tremendously important. That's where the action takes place, in fact. So uh, let's try to go as, as deep as possible and as engaging as possible with uh, all these sectors and all the uh, main stakeholders. So, uh, and we, we continue to share with you some opportunities along this session. So uh, now a, a round of questions, um, uh, Carmen, uh, una, una pregunta. And one inter interesting and very ambitious question. Um, so perhaps uh, as brief as you can, what are in your vision 
the weaknesses and strengths of, minist of health ministries to face climate change, to have to create, for example, investment programs for, for climate change. How do you see that, those weaknesses and strengths? Where do we need more action? Where are we lacking? Where do we have enough knowledge and capacity to move forward? It's not just to, to closing the gaps, but where um, can we already do some implementations to solve the impacts caused by climate change? How do you see that um, in within Mercosur? Well, wow, how, much, how long do we have? Well, yes, I think one strength is um, this kinds of, of things, being able to take part in, in these kinds of activities. For example, the strength of, of sharing information, intersectoral aspect that cuts across different organizations and support from all organizations is very important for us because sometimes we need someone from the outside to tell us what we need to do, even if we already know, but we don't make the decision until someone from outside, uh, for example, the WHO or the or PAHO or Lancet Countdown and tells us, well, then that is taken more seriously in a way. And so for us, a strength has been that at the political level, authorities have become aware of, of the fact that this issue cuts across all sectors. When governments have made it mandatory, whether by law or a decree from the executive branch, when they establish that all ministries need to work um, together environment, uh, finance, economy, health, uh, need to work on climate change. For us, it has been a great opportunity to show how important it is and how important environmental determinants of health are. So that is one strength. But as far as the weaknesses is, well, when that doesn't happen, uh, many times, People think well, climate change is something that is going to happen from now to 50 years. Well, it's going to be rain and a rate in temperature. And so the person who is in a position for five years, perhaps, well, they think, well, I'm not going to be here then. I have to deal with issues today and tomorrow. So that is a weakness, a weaknesses, perhaps. Not being able to um, make people uh, become aware of the importance of, of these issues right now. Another weakness that I find is that in general, the health sector doesn't negotiate on these issues at the international level. We're not always represented in framework conventions. We are not the ones who are uh, discussing things with funding sources, it's sometimes through environment ministries or foreign affairs ministries. So that is also a weakness because we will learn about things late. For example, the ATTACH network initiative is something that not all Mercosur countries learned about it when it was launched. So right now we are trying to make the people who are involved in those negotiating tables, uh, let them know that we are interested. So please sign us up. Um, so I think that is a big challenge that we have is to, to create and to strengthen governance. It's not easy, it takes years to work on building teams, having a, a leadership line, but health and environment issues are always seen of, of like, oh, the, this is interesting. But then uh, the urgent things are um, 
sort of leave the, these interesting things behind. So we're putting down fires, um, these really urgent issues, and those uh, emerging issues take all the attention and there's not a longer term uh, perspective to look at the future. So I think that is our biggest challenge to be able to, to build these teams and, and to be able to show how relevant these issues are and how important it is to generate the spaces like you were mentioning, Daniel, with committees, with people who are appointed with permanent spaces so that it's not something that happens today and then tomorrow we forget. Thank you so much, Carmen. You make great points. Fred, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I always love to hear from the ground, you know, who are people who are working closely with interactions with the communities. Um, one, uh, I would like to ask you, can you describe how the various levels of government? I mean, I think you have addressed a little bit already in your opening presentation. Um, so how can uh, government and no, non-governmental actors can coordinate and collaborate to deliver uh, a strong climate and health program rooted in the real needs of people and communities? Uh, what's your thoughts uh, about that, Pratt? Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. I think uh, there's a couple of things that come to mind. The first is it's really important to engage all of those various uh, partners early in the process. We hear this often when we're thinking about making plans that we want to co-produce or uh, engage with people, make sure that their objectives, their views, their goals are reflected in any process. And so I think that, that that engagement is important. It's also not possible to engage everybody on an issue. And so you need to be practical and strategic, I think. Um, but in British Columbia, one of the challenges and opportunities is around having clear roles and responsibilities for the various pieces of the system. So. We all know that health systems are very complex. Public health is one small and important part of this very broad network that takes care of people at any uh, place along a spectrum of needing care. And so in British Columbia, a concrete example of, of this is in response to the heat event that I mentioned earlier. We now have what we call the BC HARS, H-A-R-S, the Heat Alert Response System. And this is a place where uh, a number of individuals from a broad array of organizations have designed a process uh, to respond to heat events, to get prepared for heat events. This includes multiple levels of government uh, and a range of recommendations for, for everybody involved. And so the fact that this process uh, was motivated by an urgent need that helps it be viewed as legitimate. The fact that it was uh, as inclusive as it could be in its creation and its delivery means that uh, it's likely to be perceived as valuable by people and to be effective. And what we've seen is that it has been effective. We are, we're more organized than ever for extreme heat events. And the really important part, uh, and this ties into some of what Carmen mentioned, is the need to continually learn. And so what I really love about this, uh, this group of people in this process is every time they meet, every time there's a heat event that we've had uh, last summer, for example, it's a rapid learning opportunity where uh, minor adjustments are made, where you apply what you learned in real time. And that's very rewarding as a person who works in a complex system. It can sometimes be hard to create change or to refine a complex process. And so our BC heat alert response system is a great example, I think, of various actors working together with a common goal in a way that feels effective. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there to make sure there's time, but I'm happy to have a follow up on that as well. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg, for uh, sharing those um, very good insights. Uh, 
Anivar, I'm going to change a little bit the run of show here, and I'm going to ask you a question that wasn't uh, discussed previously. But I think it's very right. important because you're bringing the, uh, the, the, the aspect of, of, of financing. So uh, I'm here in New York for a meeting actually that happened yesterday with Welcome Trust, Rockefeller Foundation, and 40 plus institutions on climate and health funders meeting. So there are most philanthropist organizations that, uh, and, and the discussion here was how much philanthropic organizations should be doing the work of governments and in, 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 because you know they are filling some gaps that are being left by things that should be done by government. And but 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 money is not infinite. So at some point, you know, some line has to be <laughs> has to be put on the ground, and then this is how far we're gonna go. So one question for you is how do you think that would be like a perfect or or an ideal or where should we should we be transitioning to when thinking of different modalities of investments? How much of governmental investments are needed through the Green Climate Fund, through loans, which basically is what the Green Climate Fund is providing, and the World Bank and, and these other mechanisms, versus private sector investments, versus philanthropist investments? And you know, in your view, what's the what 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 can you can you help us thinking from from your end? Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. I think that's a very excellent question, well calibrated. Um, one approach that we take at the five C's is that we work with countries because um, the work that we do uh, in responding to climate change uh, is not based on our needs. Yes, we have a vision and we have a mission as to where we want to go, but that has to be fulfilled by working with the countries. And when I say that is that uh, the, the work that we do comes as a request from the countries. Let me give you an example. For example, uh, the Bahamas. The work that we're doing uh, reflects their needs. And that's why I said it's very important to work very closely with the countries. Um, so we we work uh, with we we work for example for the concept note we work with very closely with the Ministry of Health and all other related uh, key stakeholders both at the national level and at the international level. For example, also um, there's a PAHO country office in the Bahamas, so we ensure that during the development process uh, that country that particular institution uh, organization is involved along with others ones that are are working uh, in the health sector. Now, how is it that we ensure that we, we do not overlap with what the governments want uh, and, 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 and what we want? We ensure that um, their needs and their wants, uh, sorry, their needs are, are, are captured through their national uh, policies, national plans, national strategies, uh, the legislation. Uh, we have to ensure that what we do is aligned with that. And of course, um, there's a lot of, there's, while there's a lot of resources out there from multiple um, donors, philanthropists, you know, um, a multilateral organization, and even governments who also support uh, this cause uh, in the health, we, ha we have to be very, very uh, realistic at what we can accomplish uh, for the countries. Uh, for example, for the GTF, uh, the investment projects that we are developing, for example, for the Bahamas, uh, this, the, cent, the five C's is accredited to, to, um, to receive grants for these, on behalf of these countries up to 50 million US dollars. So we have to work within that scope uh, to, 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 um, to support these countries. Now, we have to ensure that there's no overlaps. So we have to work very closely with the countries to ensure that one, we are not duplicating what uh, the countries are doing or what, what other institutions are doing. For example, if PAHO is already uh, developing a surveillance system for uh, climate health uh, sensitive uh, diseases, then of course we cannot design and use a, another system that will do the same work. But basically we have to use investment to build on that, to expand on that, to ex expand its reach and its impact. Uh, therefore that also allows us to be more efficient and more effective with the resources that we have. 
And of course, if we are already uh, tapping into the GCF, the Green Climate Fund for resources, uh, we can still use resources from other uh, donors, for example, philanthropists. Um, but of course, the work has to complement what the current government is doing. We cannot overlap and so forth. So we have to really manage that process very, very cleanly. And that is one of the key things that we try to ensure that uh, we do. And of course, uh, we have to ensure that there's, the, the, there's various needs. For example, in a different, uh, for example, uh, while, while structuring a, a uh, an investment project. One of the first things that we need to look at is the institutional policy and legislative uh, framework. Does uh, the country needs help there? No, we don't. If, if the country says no, then we don't go there. Now when we look at the investment aspect, uh, uh, the healthcare facilities, uh, the different institutions, you know, um, do they need to be retrofitted? Uh, do they need to be greened uh, with smart technologies and also with improved water systems with enhanced waste um, wastewater? Uh, uh, is there a, a need to retrofit to climate proof against um, uh, category five um, storms, hurricanes, you know, when it comes to winds and rainfall and, and, and all of those stuff? Uh, do we need to do that? Yes or no? And that also allows us to be efficient with our funds. The other aspect of the investment we have to look at is now a building capacities and building awareness. At what level do we go? How do we complement what's uh, ongoing? Yeah. And therefore, uh, and that also allows us to be uh, very um, useful uh, in terms of managing the amount of funds. And of course, the investment is not limited only to one donor. For example, uh, the concept node that we, we're doing with the Bahamas, uh, we can also use funds from other sources to complement it. Because one of the uh, requirements from the GCF is that, you know, is there any co-financing? And co-financing comes from different uh, aspects. It can come from loans. It can come from other, from the private sector. Uh, it can come from other, um, from budgets from the government and, and also from other, um, a promissory uh, grants or, or resources that other institutions are, um, are providing to the government. So we also blend that in within the investment. So while uh, we can, uh, for example, for the Green Climate Fund, while we can access up to 50 million US dollars for a project, it does not limit us only to 50 million dollars. We have the co-financing aspect, which can allow us to increase that uh, investment amount. So therefore, um, the key point is we have to ensure that there's no overlap, there's complementary, and maximize as much as possible the donors that exist to, to create the maximum impact for an investment. Excellent. Thank you, Anivar. And I can see by the chat that, you know, new groups are being formed, new projects are being brewed. It's great to see the interactions in the chat. I'm amazed to see how sometimes these things can uh, trigger action uh, and interest by others. Uh, so brilliant. Uh, we have one minute left. So what I'm going to, I was supposed to do the closing, but I'll leave it to you guys. So I'll ask for each of you in 20 seconds, each one, to say, you know, what message you'd like people to leave this session with? What if, you know, choose one thing that you think that uh, we should be pursuing or, or a, a inspiring story that you like to, to, to share and leave people inspired to advance. Uh, that's also important, right? To inspire people. I think that that's what uh, these sessions are about. So please go ahead uh, in 20 seconds each, please. And, and, and let's finish this with, uh, with a high note and a, a, a note of hope for, for the future as well. Please, Carmen, you start. Bien, viendo la explosión del chat. Well, uh, I see that the chat has exploded and groups and connections are being created. I think that together we can do more and we're stronger. Thank you. Your your notes of, of hope and, and, and for the future. Yeah, I would say don't be afraid to start. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You're never going to be perfect doing this complex work the first time around. So just start and it's going to there's going to be embarrassing moments where you don't do it perfectly, but just keep going. <laughs> brilliant. That That's brilliant. I mean, I hit my face on the wall many times and I'll, I'll continue to do so in the future as well. So great. No, that's brilliant. Anivar, any any thoughts on your side? Definitely, definitely. One of the uh, 
key messages is that um, allow the continuous engagement in this process, you know, uh, in, in the health and climate change realm. We need to be continuous in terms of engagement, towards uh, our participation. It's a long process adapting uh, towards climate change and addressing climate change impacts. It's a long process. Uh, we must remain hopeful. We must work as a team. We must uh, unite. And more importantly, we need to be stewards you know, of, our, of our planet to ensure that we do our fair share, our part in uh, fighting uh, the impacts of climate change you know, and, and building resilience, uh, especially within the health sector. Excellent, brilliant. I mean, thank you so much for our three honored and brilliant panelists to, uh, to, that help us to build this session today. I will ask you, please take a look at the chat, Carmen, Craig, and Anivar, if you hadn't the chance, and try to answer as many questions as possible. There are many asks for uh, joining forces, for more materials. I think that you, you really did a great job in engaging this audience. We had over 550 persons at some point in, during the session. So you're reaching out, not only the Pan-American course, but, but the globe, like we said, Philippines, Germany, Ethiopia, so all over the place. I mean, it's brilliant that, uh, that people were here today. I would like to thank everyone for uh, participating in this session today, and especially Carmen, Craig, and Anivar for uh, their brilliant interventions that inspire us to move forward together. So thank you very much for your day. And I hope that we can meet in the next course, maybe tomorrow in the Belmont Forum session or, um, or anywhere else in the world on time. Thank you very much and have a good day to everyone. Thank you. Gracias a ustedes y sigamos en esta línea que vamos bien. Thank you everyone and let's keep going along this path. We're doing well.